Hi there, my name is Nicola Osborne and I'm Social Media Officer at Adina. I'm going to be talking to you today about social media and how you can use it to help people get engaged in your work and in your projects. Um, I'm hoping to inspire you with some of my examples and um, for you to be able to ask me questions afterwards online, either via Twitter or via my blog where this video will also be posted. So, um, enjoy. So the first thing I'm wondering is why use social media um, for your projects? Well, first of all, presence in social media let you get your project branding and news out to the broadest audience well ahead of the time that you're actually launching whatever you've been building or working on. So some of you have already been working on your projects for a while and some of you may already be using social media for a, a little while. Um, so I want this presentation to help you think about how you might use it better, um, if, if not how to use it for the first time. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, blogs, they're all mainstream things now. They're things that most people who are using the internet will be looking at in some kind of way. They'll be influenced at least by things that are shared in those spaces. YouTube is actually one of the world's most popular search engines, so a really, po really powerful place to be. And search engines also rank social media sites quite highly, so if you have a presence in one of those sites pointing back to your project website, the odds are that the social media will help you find a new audience and then they can go and look at the other official presences you've set up. But social media is always only going to be part of the picture. Um, email, phone, all of the kind of tangible communications you'd expect, um, including things like letters, but also print, posters, those kinds of things. Those are all still really important. And social media and those traditional communication methods are both more powerful if you put them together. Email is perhaps, um, slightly perversely, one of the most important ways to get people into social media tools. Adding a link to your social media presence at the end of an email can make a really big difference as to how many people come and find it and engage with it. So there are lots of different ways in which you can be more creative um, with what you're communicating uh, by using blogs, by using Facebook, by using Twitter. Um, there was a nice example of a, a local Scottish project that works on Lothian Health or Archives um, who had man were managing to make really good benefits from having their recipe featured on the Great British Bake Off. It was quite a small section in the program, but by posting an image of that recipe on their blog and talking about the fact they'd been on the program and linking back to the program, they both found a new way to engage people who are not necessarily aware of the archive um, through the press coverage, but also allowing people who are already engaged with the archive to find out that they'd been featured somewhere else. So they made all those connections and managed to make a much sort of better impact from that appearance than if they'd just have let that um, image of a recipe appear on telly on its own. So if you're thinking about what tools you should be using or are already using, um, I would say you should pick the tools that are most appropriate for your audience. There's a whole range of things you could use. Um, in addition to all of the tools I've mentioned already, there are things like social bookmarking tools uh, like Digo. Um, there are special um, professionally targeted or academic targeted websites like LinkedIn or academia.edu uh, or Mendeley that might be appropriate to certain audiences. It will depend on where they are already hanging out, what they're already doing online. And if you can find out what they're already doing by, by Googling around, by asking them, then you'll find the right kind of social media spaces in which to engage them and get their participation. One of the best things you can do, no matter which presences you have, is to bring your content to life to find quirky, playful ways into um, showcasing what you have, showcasing what your project is about. Um, but it's also an opportunity to reflect on what's happening in your project, uh, what's gone well, perhaps even what's gone less well, and discussing why things take a bit longer than they should, um, as long as that's in a sort of appropriate way. You can also share your key updates, your milestones, your achievements. That's going to be really important for people like your funders, people like your project partners, but also people who are really keen to find out what's happening next. Um, I think it can be easy to forget that there's often people who are really keen to hear what's happening and they're really excited when they get updates. Um, you can also preview and announce and amplify your events. I'll talk a bit more about that a little bit later on. And you should also take the opportunity to explain that you're going to be at an event, that you're going to be taking part in something. Let people know what you're doing. Don't just do it quietly because um, they might want to come and meet you. They might want to help you build your network up. And certainly any social media presence is a great way to build up your relationship with your stakeholders, with your potential users of the website you're building, um, with anyone who is interested in your work. And you need to be sort of personal but be appropriate. So you'll find your own voice. It can take a little while, but you'll find a voice for the project and perhaps for different individuals in the project or perhaps as a sort of collective project voice. 
So I've got a nice example of some quirky ways into a fairly dense project. Trading Consequences is a text mining project and that can be quite complex to describe. Some of our posts are quite technical. But one of our academics had a PhD student interested in trades of gin and quinine as commodities. So he wrote us a fantastic post on gin and tonic, a short history of a stiff drink. Um, he wrote this for another website and for our site to sort of talk about the different changes in commodity training, what they sort of said about drinking habits at the time. It's a really interesting way in. It was a proper rigorous academic post and it was really quirky. It was very easy for people to share because it was a, a short pithy title and was clearly what it was about. Um, there are other ways to let people know what's going on with your project and as we all know the people behind your project is particularly engaging. People like other people, that's why social media is so powerful. It's connecting up lots of individuals to each other. Um, so letting people meet those people and have them explain why your project matters can be really, really powerful to do. We made a video for the Addressing History project a couple of years ago in which we asked um, Professor Richard Rogers, who's on screen just now, um, to talk about why he uses post office directories and why it was important for those to be digitised because our, our project was building on digitised post office directories. You can see the tangible item, he's holding it in certain shots, and that helps explain where the digital material came from. Um, he talks about how he uses it and why this information is important and useful and relevant. We have mapping experts then talking about digitised maps and why they're relevant. Just giving people the opportunity to find out what the project's about and why these things have been put together, how they've come to be put together, can be very, very useful, can really help people engage with what's going on. And all of this work is about being part of something bigger. So your project doesn't sit in isolation, it doesn't sit within a sort of geographical isolation, it's not necessarily just for academic people to be interested in. Um, there will be a much bigger audience that are interested in your work that maybe want to work with you in the future or that want to use the resource you're building or want to find out more about what's going on. And if you can be part of that bigger something, it can make your, powerful, your project that much more powerful. So I've got a nice sort of example here of where someone's really properly engaging with bigger issues. This is a knitwear designer. She's been to see a quilting exhibition and she's seen a quilt that talks about historical issues, including sort of race and slavery. And she feels that history has been misquilted as opposed to misquoted in this, ta in this, um, in this piece. She gets some really intelligent qu questions back and comments back. And the reason this is such a nice example is because she really appreciates those comments she's had back and comments back to them and starts a proper dialogue with her audience and is suddenly part of this much bigger debate that is only a, a tangent from what she normally posts about but is something she's really interested in. And I think that idea that you should reward people for taking part, that you should respond to them is very powerful if you want to build up this network, this audience in social media. In general though, you also want to be proactive. So we, were, we went to look for people who we should follow from um, the Dressing History Project again. Um, to see who might be useful, who might be working in the right kind of area. We found um, a genealogist called Chris Patton and he happened uh, to see that we'd followed him, blogged about our project and that blog post we, we thought was brilliant. It was explaining what we do and so we replied back to him on Twitter, we replied back to him on his blog and said thank you, we showed him where he could find more information, we built up a relationship. He actually turned out to be a really important key supporter. He wrote for print publications, he still writes for print publications. Um, so he created all of this additional interest in the project from exactly the audience we wanted to hit as it happened, but we would have never have known to go to him as a contact point at the beginning. We just had the opportunity to build that relationship so that it was really useful. And in fact, it's still going on today. Um, we just added some updates to that service and He's very excited about that and helping us spread the word again. So one powerful advocate can get you a long way, can connect you to a lot of other people. Any work that you're doing, you're going to want to amplify to some extent. Um, you're going to want to let people know how they can take part. And so I've got here um, a video showing the OR 2012 website where we request people take part. We requested they help us cover the conference because we knew we couldn't cover all of it ourselves and we knew people wanted to take part from the desks, those that couldn't come to the thing in person. We provided a whole blog post explaining how you sign up for different social media tools, how you register, why you might want to contribute, how you could contribute. Um, that included things like Flickr, where we set up a group specifically designed to let people share photos that could then be reused in blog posts. 
And after the event, we really rewarded that participation by highlighting people's content, by pointing out videos they'd created, by pointing out images they'd created, by connecting to their blog posts, to their write-ups. So they were incentivized to take part. And we were able to then both enjoy the fact that we'd got all this coverage, but also share it, also make the most of those people's contributions. And that's really important. Crediting work that people have done for you, that's part of the community part of the social part of social media so you always need to credit your images that you're using um, you want to credit ideas that you had you've been to a workshop or you've run an event where you've gained some really useful feedback crediting that making links to those blogs to those websites to those twitter accounts can be really really powerful acknowledging and responding to comments really makes people feel lovely about having commented makes them more likely to join in again helps you build that community and making your own materials available to others to reuse can be very powerful in terms of getting sort of write-ups and engagement. Less is really more though in social media. You need to plan what you're going to do. It is a bit like a fireworks event. Um, you want to make sure that you're only doing things that are useful, that are relevant. Um, you want to set some goals. So you don't want to pick hundreds of different tools that you could use. Pick one or two that you're comfortable starting out with. Um, use those in an effective way. Plan the kind of content you're going to share. Work out how that's going to fit into the week or into your other project work and make sure it's realistic. And if you plan well, you should have a really good impact for your work. And as a sort of final note of caution, a little bit of pragmatism coming in, um, make sure you're always being professional. So be personal, be um, informal, but don't share commercially sensor information. Don't share stuff about your project partners that they don't want shared. Uh, don't share personal information or images without people's permission. Um, don't make downfall meme videos um, and always moderate and monitor comments and feedback because people both really want to hear back from you quickly if they've added something of real value and you'll want to make sure that you remove things that are of not, not of value for you. We actually have some social media guidelines at Adina. They include a comment moderation flow chart. Um, it looks a bit over the top, but if you get a, a negative comment, it can be incredibly useful to, to work through this and work out if you should respond to it or if you just shouldn't post it. So I've got a few further reading links there. Um, JISC has some fantastic social media resources, as do JISC Legal and NetSkills. Um, this JISC Legal covers to legal issues, NetSkills covers to practical issues of how you use these tools, and they'll, they give really good training on those. Um, we have a social media page where you can look at all our different presences and you know steal the good ideas. Um, we also have those guidelines which you're welcome to have a look at in their Creative Commons license. You're welcome to reuse them if needed. Um, you might have your own social media guidelines in your institution already, so just be aware of what's appropriate for your project. Um, I really recommend the LSE Impact blog. It has lots of guidance on using um, social media in academia. And the Acus Guide Social Networking Workplace has lots of very practical legal advice and sort of ethical advice on social media. And finally, a shout out for Flickr Commons. If you can't take your own pictures, if you don't have the kit to shoot your own video, Flickr Commons and Creative Commons searches on other um, image sites are really, really useful for just keeping things looking lively and vibrant. Social media isn't just about doing stuff online, it's also about putting some of that stuff in the physical world. And the easiest way to do that is through things like QR codes and short links basically anything that we picked up with a mobile phone. So I'm just going to show you a little example of where we've used that for one of our posters so you can have a think about how you might use that for your projects. We've used QR codes on this poster for Scottish history projects and you can see you just use a QR code reader, you scan in the code and it gives you the option to go online and look at the website attached to that code. It's a very simple way of connecting up the real world to the virtual world. Thank you very much and I look forward to hearing any of your questions that you may have.